Hello and thanks for joining us from an over 60s Sex and the City flick with a stellar cast to the latest movie from band Iranian filmmaker Jaffa Panahi. Welcome to this week's film show. Lower your chin. A little to the right. Not so far. Stay there. <laughs> and I'm joined in the studio by our film critic Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Eve. And we're going to start with a film that had its world premiere at Cannes last month and won the Screenwriting Prize. It's Jaffa Panahi's Three Faces. It's out in France this week. Um, but the director couldn't attend the festival as he's forbidden from leaving his home country of Iran. Tell us more. Well, Panahi, one of the world's most talented filmmakers, first burst on the world stage in Cannes back in 1994 with his film The White Balloon, which is actually about a little girl and her goldfish. And that won the camera door for the best movie by a first-time director. Panahi's subsequent films won prizes, delighted audiences, until eight years ago when he ended up on the wrong side of the Iranian regime and he was sentenced to a 20-year travel ban and has been forbidden to make movies. Now that said, Three Faces is the fourth film he has ingeniously somehow managed to make since then. One was supposedly smuggled to the Khan Selection Committee on a U.S. bee key baked into a piece of pastry. I don't know how this one made the trip, but I'm glad it did. Uh, it's worth noting that the high highest levels of the French government uh, requested special dispensation to the director so that he could come to Cannes, but he was not permitted to leave Iran. And, and it would have been tricky to smuggle a grown man baked into a piece of pastry. <laughs> okay, well, here's the leading lady talking about the director. There is no difference between Panahi, the filmmaker, and the man. He has had many difficulties in his life, and he made this film despite these obstacles. It was very important for him to be recognized internationally, and I am sure he'll continue to make beautiful films. Now, the film begins with a young girl, a uh, young woman, actually, walking through a cave as seen on a cell phone video, pleading with one of Iran's leading actresses, who you just saw there, uh, Benaz Jafari, to intercede on her behalf because she wants to be an actress, and she has been accepted to a drama academy in the city, but her traditional rural family absolutely will not hear of it. Now, there are some sinister elements in this video which upset the actress so much when she receives it that she convinces her director for friend, that would be Panahi playing himself, uh, to drive her to the village to see if the girl is okay. Let's take a glimpse. Lisa, is the girl okay? Ah, well, that's a mystery for much of the running time. Uh, as the two professionals from the city make their way through this rural section of Iran, uh, they have fascinating interactions with the locals, each one of them a little window onto tradition and challenges to tradition. And just what you might be thinking they're backward, you find out they're actually quite sophisticated when they need to be, as in their novel solution for how to handle two-way traffic with blind spots on winding mountain roads. I like this quite a bit. It's deceptively simple but it explores really important topics from ambition to the evolution of rural communities and especially the rights of women, in this case, three generations of females pre- and post-revolution. Well, let's move on now to something very, very different. <laughs> um, it's out this week in France. It's called Book Club, and it brings us four very accomplished women um, who embark on reading the trilogy Fifty Shades of Grey. 
Did it make you laugh? <laughs> it did. I, I'm, I'm not even embarrassed to say so. For moviegoers roughly my age or older, the prospect of getting to watch Jane Fonda, Diane Keaton, Candice Bergen, and Mary Steenburgen trading quips is just inherently tempting. Uh, everybody thinks it's teenagers, but actually the people who most consistently go to the movies are a category we'll call older people. We have the patience to wait in line for tickets. Uh, unless we're on a waiting list for an organ transplant, we can go a whole two hours without checking our cell phones compulsively, and because we have lifetimes of memories of the communal experience of film going, we actually know how to behave ourselves in a theater. I saw this at a sneak preview with probably 150 French people of various ages, and we laughed. I know I did. If I'd seen this in a screening room with a bunch of fellow critics, I'm pretty sure that the prevalent sound would have been groaning rather than laughing, and that's because there are forced, absolutely terrible double entendres, <laughs> as the four women supposedly greatly inspired by reading these books, confront the current state of their respective sex lives. The whole thing is kind of stiff and creaky, maybe even arthritic, but I had a good time. <laughs> this is unabashedly about the supposed problems of well-to-do white people. Fonda's Vivian owns a luxury hotel with a staff of 150. Bergen Sharon is a federal judge. Steenbergen's Carol is a chef. It would have been beyond ludicrous to try to shoehorn in a black or Latina or Asian character, and perhaps this movie will be studied for that uh, decades hence. Here's a look at the film and what Jane Fonda told you at Cannes about reading the book in question. This book made me realize that it's been quite a while since we, you know. As in, as in weeks? Mm, like maybe six. Six weeks? Months. Oh my God, I thought you guys were like rabbits. We are. If rabbits took a ton of Benadryl and made a chastity pact. Oh my God, we have to yeah. put a stop to this. Oh, yeah. come on. I mean, if women our age were meant to have sex, God wouldn't do what he does to our bodies. Whoa. Well, speak for yourself. Well, that was not God. That was Dr. Nazarian. <laughs> I read the book when it first came out. Um, I'm glad it was written. I, th I think that, um, you know, I think that it inspired and woke up s many women in the United States. Lisa, you do know your homework for next week is to read <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey, don't you? Um, what does the film have to say about romance and nookie amongst seniors? Uh, well, it may be that if you, even if you have a beautiful zillion dollar house, you might still end up having sex in the backseat of a car. Um, there is one dialogue exchange here that has me wondering whether the entire film sprang out of a bet as if as to whether it's possible for E.L. James's Fifty Shades of Grey and the work of extraordinary documentary maker Werner Herzog to get together in the same gag because they managed to do it. Here's how. Bergen's federal judge mentions that she hasn't had sex since her divorce 18 years ago, and her friends wonder, well, what's a vagina like that hasn't been used for 18 years? And the answer is that Werner Herzog made a film about it called Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Now, that's as hilarious as it is obscure. <laughs> In case you're wondering, Cave of Forgotten Dreams is a 2010 dazzling 3D spin through France's Chauvet Caves and the very old paintings on their ancient walls. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, well now to an actor and um, an occasional director, Stanley Tucci's final portrait. Now, it's about the painter and sculptor Alberto Giacometti and the American art critic James Lord. Is final portrait a good title for this? Oh, it's an excellent title and it works on at least two levels that I can think of. Lord wrote a memoir about posing for Giacometti in 1964 and how what was supposed to be a brief one day sitting turned into an extended stay in Paris. Giacometti was perpetually dissatisfied with the canvas and he would insist on starting over and over and over. This was also the last picture he completed before his death. Did he know he was staving off the Grim Reaper or was he just persnickety and chronically dissatisfied with his own work? Let's take a look. This is going really badly. Mm. There's no question of finishing it so much. Then why are we here? What? I said, I said then why are we here? It's useful for me. It's what I deserve, I suppose, after 35 years of dishonesty. That's what I am. I'm dishonest. I'm a, I'm a liar. Dishonesty? How do you mean? All these years that I've been showing things, you know, they were all, they were all unfinished. Probably shouldn't have been started in the first place. So is it a bit rude to ask someone um, for a day of their time and then stretch it out, even if you are a big artist like Giacometti? I know you wouldn't like it. <laughs> 
I thought this was rude too. Uh, but I just came across a passage in a Malcolm Gladwell essay that changed my mind. I quote, when Cezanne was painting a portrait of the critic Gustave Geoffroy, he made him endure 80 sittings over three months before announcing the project of failure. The result is one of that string of masterpieces at the Musée d'Orsay. When Cezanne painted his dealer, Ambroise Vollard, he made Vollard arrive at 8 in the morning and sit on a rickety platform until 11.30 without a break on 150 occasions before abandoning the portrait. He would paint a scene, repaint it, paint it again, end quote. The actors are wonderful. Geoffrey Rush is Giacometti and Army Hammer is his friend and subject. In real life, of course, Hammer is one of the world's certified straight hunks, but it's worth noting that this is the third time he has played a gay man. J. Edgar Hoover's uh, lifelong companion, Clyde Tolson in J. Edgar, the Adonis-like visiting art student in Call Me By Your Name, and now this. Oh, fabulous. I'm a big fan of him. Well, we're going to leave you now and with a glimpse of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, which is out today. It's the fifth instalment of the franchise, Lisa. Uh, without having seen it, uh, all I'm prepared to say about Jurassic World is that it sounds like a good alternative title for the Donald Trump presidency, doesn't it? And these two guys, there's only a movie they say they want to see every 65 million years or so, so I promised I'd take them right after the show. Do all these cuddly toys live on your bed, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Classified information. Okay, well, remember our website. We're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up in France 24 after this. Jurassic World, the island. You're all right. Easy, girl. All of that is in the past. Am I dead? Not yet, kid. I want to show you the future. What is that thing? They made it. You are here. Your program spotlighting French heritage. Versailles, the Louvre, Mont Saint-Michel are well-known stars of French heritage. But French genius and France harbors many other hidden treasures. The arts, gastronomy, architecture, as well as nature's wonders. Come along with France 24. Discover France's living heritage. From young apprentices to accomplished craftsmen and farmers, to Michelin star sporting chefs, meet these people whose passion for their professions preserve and drive French heritage. You are here on France 24 and France24.com.